It's fun, doesn't it? All right. It was great being at camp, and obviously the central message was about Jesus being king in our lives and the power of salvation. And this morning, come on down. This morning we have a couple that are being baptized, a brother and a sister. And uh, baptism is, as we talked about two weeks ago in the message, uh, if you want to know more about baptism, the, uh, uh, the sermon two weeks ago, we dealt with it in depth and what it means. And just basically, baptism is a symbol. It's a demonstration, an outward expression of an inward reality of what God has done in our lives. And Carson, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. And you're going to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Amen. Well, based upon that public profession of faith, I baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Thank you, brother. And this is Kara. They are brothers and sisters, and mom and dad are here as a family. And Kara, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And you're going to follow him all the days of your life? Amen. Well, based upon that public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. God bless you. All right. Let's all stand together and let's worship the Lord. Good job. Let's do our voices and sing unto the Lord. inside us we cannot take
guys sing this with me. God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your desire. May this offering stretch across the sky. These hallelujahs may multiply. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to sing this morning. I saw my guilt upon your cross. on a Sunday morning. Let's go to his word. We're in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. The author of Hebrews tells us that we are running this race of faith and to keep our eyes on Jesus and what he has done for us and how he has overcome and tells us to be mindful of the things that hinder us from this race or the sin that entangles us, that keeps us from running this race effectively. Oftentimes that sin and 
habits, uh, things that just draw our attention away from the purposes of the Lord. It can happen to all of us. And so many times we begin to make excuses over and over again. And the author here says, quit playing with that. Just throw it off. Get rid of it. Throw it off whatever hinders you and the sin that so easily entangles. Let's bow our heads as we reflect upon the scripture this morning. Father, we understand that we can make excuses for everything. But Lord, our desire is to keep our eyes focused on you, to run this race of faith. Lord, that we would not try to substantiate our sinful ways and sinful habits, but simply, Lord, recognize what those things are and to rid ourselves of them. So Lord, would you search us this morning Show us what these things are. Perhaps they're habits, maybe habits in our thinking. Maybe it's worry, maybe it's anger. But Lord, search us and know us. Help us, Lord, to identify these things, to throw these things off, that we may run the race of faith. Lord, as we gather, we gather in your name. And we sing unto you to praise your holy name. For as the scripture says, it is good and fitting to praise the name of the Lord. We lift our hands, we lift our voices for your glory. And it's in your name, Christ Jesus, we pray. I cry to you In darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy Were you to count my sin how could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone.
that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice and I will wait for you I will wait for you through the storm and through the night. I will wait for you, surely wait for you, for your love is my delight. Let's pray together. Lord, we unite our hearts together with you in the center, realizing that you've made a way for all of us, for any to come into your presence through the blood of Jesus. Lord, we confess that you are our Lord, you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. Lord, we ask that you would use this time, Lord, to make us more like you. Lord, that we would grow in our love towards one another. And Lord, you would sharpen our vision that you have given us for this world. And Lord, we pray that you would help us. Lord, we ask that as we've come together that we would pray for one another. We pray that you would bring healing for those that are hurting, restoration for those that are estranged. And Lord, we might experience your kingdom here on earth in its fullness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and if you would, open up your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. We will be in chapter 11, and we're continuing our series on the Lord's Supper. Uh, it's just a two-part series, and it has uh, been really good talking about the ordinances or the things that, we, that the Lord gave us to express our faith in a powerful way. And uh, these expressions, obviously, there's only two, baptism, the Lord's Supper. Some would throw in feet washing, and uh, we're welcome to do that anytime you want. Uh, it's probably needed. Uh, in many ways, for many respects, but um, how many of you know that the body of Christ is just awesome? You ever considered yourself as part of something that is eternal? Not just that you have eternal life, but you're a part of something that is eternal. When you've been united into Christ by faith, you join a group known as the saints. A saint is someone who's been born again, redeemed. You've, you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Positionally, God the judge sees you as holy. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. Did you know that? That's a fact. That's an eternal truth. Did you realize that you are a part 
of what's called the blood-washed body of Christ or even bride of Christ. And how many of you know Jesus is coming back? A couple of you, that's good. The rest, the rest, he's coming back. And he's coming back for a spotless bride, which you're a part of. And as we get, begin to grow in the Lord, we become more purified. But it's not just something we do individually, it's something we do corporately. We have a church agreement. It's the Bible. And we've stated it even into a church covenant, which says we will, we will protect the testimony of our church. We will protect the doctrines of, of the Bible. We will protect the, the unity we will protect the vision, and we are protectors of these things so that we as a body would become exactly what he's called us to be. In fact, Peter says this. He says, live up to your calling that God has given you in Christ Jesus. And we are to do that. We are to do it on purpose, meaning it's not just something you do passively. It's something you do actively. Passively, you've been made righteous. But growing into the image of Christ is something you and I do actively. And many of this, these things, and all of these things actually are centered around two symbols. One is baptism, which is talking about coming into Christ. The other is the Lord's Supper, which is the continuation in Christ and the growing in Christ. Until, in fact, when we partake the Lord's Supper, we are to do it until He comes back. It's an ongoing thing with an ongoing meaning, with an ongoing transformation in your life and my life. So if if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you have repented of all your sins, you are a part of the body of Christ. When you are baptized into a local church, then you become a part of the local body of Christ. And as you participate in the Lord's Supper, you are re-upping every time. You're, you're saying, yes, Jesus Lord, and I'm going to serve him with all my life. And, but what exactly does the Lord's Supper mean? And what is it? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 1. He says this. He says, uh, First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in all these things and you keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So he's saying, man, you guys are doing great. You, you have done really well. But then in verse 17, he says this, now in giving the following instructions, I do not praise you. Verse 2, I do praise you. I mean, you're doing good in one area, but in verse 17, you're doing not so good in another area. And it's how you do church. It's what you do when you come together as the assembled. Church is just ecclesia, that's the word, and it means called out, the called out ones. And when we are gathering ourselves together, we as the church do churchy type things. So you are the church, we are the church, and when we come together, we celebrate the things that the Lord has given us. And he said, when you do this, man, it's not good. In fact, if you've read 1 Corinthians or you know anything about the church of Corinth, they were some messed up people. They just were, just like me, just like you. And they had no tradition. I mean, they were the first church. They were the, the first ones to follow Jesus in this pagan world, and they got a lot of things wrong. I mean, Man, chapter 5 is just gross and how he's rebuking them of just gross sins. Chapter 7, he has to restructure what marriage is all about. And chapter 11, he rebukes them again. Chapter 13, uh, 12, 13, and 14 is a rebuke of what happens during church time and you make sure that you do it right. Chapter 15 is reminding them that you're mortal and you must die so you can turn into immortality and it's the resurrection of Jesus that makes this all happen. So they were a church that wrote Paul some questions saying, man, we don't know how to do this. And he, he writes them this letter that's an occasional letter. He wrote on an occasion and he's correcting them. And so the Corinthian people are, you know, even though they were first century and even though they got some intermingled, some paganism, and he corrected them on it, they're, they're a church just like us. You know, you've heard it said, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll mess it up, right? And there's a problem. What happens when church goes bad? Do you ever have a bad experience in a church? Sure you have. You should. Have you ever seen... I can't believe I'm going to ask this question. It's so embarrassing. Have you ever seen a sick person in a hospital? Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. And Jesus says, a, a church, he's the great physician, 
and he came for those that are sick. And a church is God offering an invitation, all who are weary and all who are heavy laden, come to me and I'll give you rest. And so you end up at church with a lot of people like you and me, got hangups and holdups and problems. We do. But we are to grow together. But when church activity becomes an obstacle to the worship of God, then there is a major issue. It's when church is bad, when divisions are set in place. We see this very clearly in Malachi chapter 1 in the Old Testament, verses 1 through 14, that first chapter in the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and it doesn't end well, the book of the Old Testament. It ends with, there's going to be a hope someday, but right now, I'm through talking with you. 400 years before Christ came onto the scene, the book of Malachi was written, and God says this, your worship offends me. Sometimes we think the most offensive places in the world are on Skid Row. That's not true. The most offensive places to God in the world is when church is done wrong with wrong attitudes and wrong hearts. Do you you understand that? The, The hardest sermons Jesus ever preached were to the most religious individuals, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. And it goes right in line with Malachi when Malachi is the prophet proclaiming to the children of Israel, on behalf of God, and he says this, your worship is stench to my nostrils. And you're like, wow. And then he says this, it would have been better if you never even went to temple. But now that you do, and you do it in the wrong way, uh, it's not going to go well for you. And here's what they would do. They would, you know, in the temple system, and we talked about the old economy of the Old Testament, that there was the, the ceremonial law, was where they would bring turtle doves or lambs or heifers and they would sacrifice them. And it was a symbol of we give our best to God. It was the firstborn. It was the unspotted lamb. It was the the one that would win uh, the FFA competition. And you would give that to the Lord. But instead what they were doing, they were bringing the blind sheep or the lame lambs or they would, they would bring a defect, the one that they couldn't sell at the sale barn, nobody would want. So oh, let's give that one to God. And the Lord says, no, you give your best. You prioritize your, you prioritize your life around truth, and God is worthy of everything. And in Malachi, he says, no. In fact, God says, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And the canon was shut. And God didn't speak through a prophet for 400 years until Zechariah in the prophecy of, of John the Baptist and Jesus was coming when he was in the temple. So God is very serious, very serious about how, what we do when we come together, which that's what we're doing right now. And it's centered around the symbol, one of the symbols, the Lord's Supper. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he starts off in verse 17, listen, uh, here's something you guys need to, need to work on. And then in this process in rebuking them of how they've done it wrong, we learn how we should function with one another. And it's a, it's a major problem. So he says this, I've got this against you. For to begin with, verse 18, I hear that when you come together as a church, by the way, that is a common idiom when you come together, meaning when you're having church time. There are divisions among you. In part, I believe it. There must indeed be factions among you so that the approved among you may be recognized. In other words, here's what he's saying. There's nothing wrong with conflicts. There's nothing wrong with conflicts. Some people try to avoid conflicts. Some people turn conflicts into wars. But conflicts at their very kernel, at the very essence, is good. It shows that there's a difference, and then somebody has an opportunity to teach someone else what the truth is so that we might get on the the right page. If you think conflict, now you may have experienced conflict in a very, very bad way, but just because two people disagree doesn't mean someone's in sin. It's when we bring selfishness into the situation and we bring hurtfulness in the situation that it actually becomes sin. So Paul is saying that, listen, I know that there's going to be divisions among you. In fact, those things are good so that those that respond correctly are seen as leaders or at least someone to follow. And so... Uh, By the way, don't handle conflict the way any of our politicians are handling conflict today. Are we agreed on that? I mean, it's a mess. You want to see 
the, the full extrapolation or the full fulfillment of what it is to be in the flesh and conflict, then just watch the news and watch how politics are reported. Because it seems like the ones that are the, the, the most vile, the most hurtful, those are the ones that get the TV. They get the airtime and no one else does. Don't, don't act like that. So he is moving forward and he's saying, listen, there are divisions among you. Just like, look, there's conflict among us. There just are. You will, you will have conflict with people. Is anybody married? You will have conflict with people. We've been, we celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary yesterday. It was fantastic. Amen. <clears throat> we, we did a lot of nothing. It was just a good day. I'm a big fan of doing nothing. And we did a lot of it. It was great. And I remember uh, early on, <clears throat> family of origin is a major issue, right? The way you are brought up. And in this room, we have people who've been brought up in many different ways. When my wife and I got married, um, I said, hey, we'll fry some eggs. And the way we fried eggs in my home in Oklahoma is on our oven. We had a tin little, a little tin uh, pitcher, and it had a little screen at the top, and we would pour all of our bacon in there, and we'd save the bacon grease, and it was right there. And so we would fill the pan with grease, and my wife said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, frying, I'm going to fry some eggs. She said, that's not how you do it. And I said, oh, yes, it is, honey. If, if it ain't fried, it ain't cooked. And she pulls out a crock pot, and I said, no, 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 don't bring that in here. <laughs> it's kind of, and so there's just, there's, she's from the north, I'm from the south, and fried bacon and baked whatever. That's what they do. You know, I was raised where the kids ran around naked. I mean, I'm from Oklahoma, and she wanted them clothed. And I'm like, honey, you don't have to do that. We don't have to spend money on clothes. They can run around naked. <laughs> what a waste of money. It's just going to get holes in the jeans. Just let them run around. But then you've got all the other issues that we bring into this room. Like, uh, how do you deal with conflict? Some are screamers. Some are passive. Some families, they, they never raise their tone. Other families, they don't talk unless they're screaming, right? And then you bring that, well, how do you deal with money? Some are spenders, some are savers. Some, we, we look at, how do you show love? Some people show love and they don't ever say the word love. They don't. Some say the word love and then they hug and touch a lot. And other people don't. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And we have all of this stuff that we get from a family of origin and the, the area that you're raised in, the way that you are you are nurtured as a child and you come up and, and, and some of these things are wrong. They're just not healthy with the way that I was raised or you were raised. And then we come to church and we have all these opinions about the way things should be done and we forget to get rid of those things and have the Lord realign us or reteach us. And it's called you and I are to renew our minds based upon the principles of the Word of God, not based upon the way we used to do it or the way they do it. We, we change according to the Word of God. And that's what he's saying here. There's divisions. Of course there's divisions. But how do you handle them? Bad ways to do it. You've got those that are attackers. You've got some attackers that are wolves. And you know the Bible talks about wolves. Wolves are very out front. They're very, they run in packs. And they, want, they can even take down animals that are larger than them. You have those that are, that are like snakes. They attack, but you don't really see them until it's too late. And they go around putting their venom in all kinds of people till they're all venomized with a bad thought. Then you got those that are like hornets. Hornets move in swarms. Horn, hornets can cause stampedes, right? They can. The Bible talks about each one of those, about being mad as a what? Hornet. And many people get that way. Then you got those that are passive in the way they do it. Someone who's passive is like the turtle. They see a conflict, they just pull their head in. And they just want it all to go away. And guess what? It never does. It's just stuffed. Then you got those that are like chameleons. They're just yes men. Man, we just all want to get along. Just, it's, it's all about unity, all about unity, all about unity. Then you got those weasels, passive-aggressive. They do their little dance in front of the snake and they mesmerize, they put a spell on somebody and next thing you know, they fall asleep and they eat their head. That's what weasels do. They crawl down in holes, passive but aggressive. And all those ways are wrong. Whether you're an attacker or whether you're a spectator or passive aggressive, it's all just wrong. It's not how you handle conflict. And these conflicts come from our own hearts. James says very clearly, why do 
wars and fights take place among you? Is it not because of the war that wages within your own heart? And you say, look, I'm not, I'm not at war at anything. No, really. I mean, think about it. We are so wrong and so sinful that Jesus had to die on the cross. The God-man had to suffer an eternal judgment so that I could be redeemed because of my own sin and your own sin. So you have to admit, from an eternal perspective, we all have decay and sinfulness within our heart. A guy by the name of Marshall wrote a book called Well-Intended Dragons. It's, it's a book that a lot of pastors read, talking about people in church in the midst of conflicts, how they have good intentions, but the results are like a fire-breathing dragon. It just really creates more problems in the midst of conflict. And he makes this statement, he says, I've never, he, he quotes a guy named George McLeod, he says this, I've never met a man who wanted to be bad. The mystery of man is that he is bad when he really, really wants to be good. So it's even possible to want to be good and want to be unified, but because of the sinfulness or selfishness of our heart and the lack of perspective or the lack of knowledge or the lack of self-examination, we can create a lot of problems over and having good intentions. It's possible that even in our righteousness, it's like filthy rags as Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it's a problem. In church, he goes on to say this, in church, most dragons see themselves as godly people, adequately gracious and kind, who hold another viewpoint they honestly believe is right. Unfortunately, listen to this, unfortunately, sincerity without self-examination is no excuse. So just because we're sincere, we can be right on a truth, but completely wrong the way we open our mouths. Or we become passive and just stuff it in or try to manipulate other people. It could be wrong. It's a problem. The church, and indeed every Christian, is an odd combination, listen to this, of a self-sacrificing saint. You can be this. I can be this. The church is made of people that we want to serve the Lord. We can be a self-sacrificing. We can give up time. We can give up money. We can have an intention of serving the Lord. So we can be the combination of a self-sacrificing saint and a self-serving sinner at the same time if we're not involved in self-evaluation. You can be self-sacrificial. You can be self-serving at the same time unless you are self-examinating. Can I say that again? You can be self-sacrificial. You can be giving up things for the Lord, simultaneously being self-serving. So even the Pharisees, your righteousness is as filthy rags. You're, 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 you have on the outside, everything looks good, but on the inside, things are not good. Jesus said, you are whitewashed tomb. What's a whitewashed tomb? Well, you know the tombs, they were holes in rocks and the outcrop of a of a, of a rock formation, they would hewn out a cave and a sepulcher, a place you put a body, and you place a full unembalmed body in there, and you wrap it with material, you put herbs all over it, but it still don't smell good, right? Still don't. And you say, I know, I'll fix it, I'll just paint it. No, there's still deadness on the inside, and it still stinketh, Right? It's like, it's like someone who does all the right things on the outside, but on the inside, man, it's self-serving. It's selfishness. And so we can be self-sacrificial on the outside, self-serving on the inside, unless we have self-examination. And that is incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. One of the hardest questions I was ever asked, I was, uh, I was in front of a committee, and through some oral examinations I had to go through. And I remember them asking, are you wrong in any area of your theology? Anything you believe about the Bible? Are you wrong in any area? End of times, anthropology, way man is made up, different views of the atonement. Are you wrong in any area? And I'm like, well, I guess I have to be somewhere because no one's perfect. And they said, yeah, but are you, are you wrong in any area? And I said, well, I guess I have to say yes. And they said, where? And I'm like, can't think of one spot. 
I've got the end time right. I understand creation. I got the right view of creation. I understand. And, and as I was answering that question, I realized what their point was. Is like, uh, you need a little humility and, and the power of self examination. The one who has the ability to do biblical and spirit led self examination is the individual that begins to look like Jesus. Without self examination and, and allowing the word of God to penetrate your heart, mold you, shape you, set you on a course, then you will probably get off course and you won't ever know it. You'll get off course in relationships. You'll get off course in your direction in life. You'll get off course in the way you feel about things. You, you won't have, in fact, when you and I are off course, we are like that ship that's set to sail without a rudder and that is a major problem. And that is a major problem, completely. And that's what we have to worry about in all of our dealings when we come together. So when we come together as the bride of Christ, it is to be beautiful. So here's the problem. He states it. Many of you, so here's the background. When they would come together, they would have this incredible meal. And after a meal, they would have like a potluck dinner. That's exactly what he describes. Everybody brings food. They have a love feast. That's what it's known for. And it's there to love on people, to create fellowship, to share in your bounty with everybody else. So those who don't have, that everybody can be equal around this table and then have a potluck dinner. That's how we know that the first church was Southern Baptist, right? Because they like to eat like this. And then after the dinner, this love feast, then they would partake of the Lord's Supper. They would just grab a little stuff off the table and they'd have unleavened bread and they'd grab some juice. And they'd say, okay, let's mimic what Jesus did after his last supper with the disciples. So they modeled having dinner and then eating just like Jesus did. He had, he had supper, the, the, the Passover meal, and then he did the Lord's Supper. And then he says, but there's a problem with you guys. For some of you are cutting in line, you're taking the best pieces. Some of you are drinking to an excess, and some of you don't even want other people at your table. So here you are commemorating the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're being very hateful. Do you see a problem with this? In other words, your life isn't matching the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe me, you become what you tolerate in your life. I become what I tolerate in my life. And they were tolerating the wrong things. And they thought, oh, well, everybody does it. Let's do it again. And it was a problem. Is there anything in your life that you're tolerating and you're justifying by saying everybody else does it? Or why not? Because they seem to be having fun when they do this. Listen, you become what you tolerate. And in this sense, there were factions and there was selfishness. There was gluttony. And they disrespected uh, the church of God. They were an embarrassment to those who had nothing. And what should I say to you? And here's what he says in verse 22. Uh, Should I praise you? I do not praise you for this. You are not doing good. And that is the problem. Disunity, being fueled by selfishness, and not any way to handle the conflict. They had personal conflict. They had intrapersonal conflict. They had interpersonal turmoil. They had organizational conflict. Because they, they disregarded the very mission of what it was about. And they became the purpose of their own meeting. When church becomes about us, then we are off track. Amen? When church becomes about you, uh, your, my comfort, your comfort, what I want, what you want. And it's got to be just exactly the way we want it. With the right kind of songs, with the right kind of beat, the right kind of instruments. And God says, at this point, it's better that you don't even come to church because you are offending me. Because it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about the Lord God Almighty. And my conflict in my heart reminds me of that every single time I have an objection to somebody. And then all of a sudden I go, you know what? It's not about me or them, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the solution? Look at what he says. Paul, Jesus came to him, Paul, for I received from the Lord. That's Paul speaking, verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 23, Paul says, I received from the Lord. When did he receive this from the Lord? Jesus just came to him. Jesus just came to him and said, Paul, you've been 
The Spirit of God's been leading you accurately without any error. I just want to tell you this. This is how important this self-examination is at the Lord's table for the body of Christ to be pure. The Lord came directly in front of Jesus and gave him these words. And here they are. For I see from the Lord what I pass on to you. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and he said this, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if we know anything about the Lord's Supper, here's what it does. It commemorates the atonement and the self-sacrificial death in your place, so that you and I might be forgiven. If it's not about anything else, it's about commemorating the forgiveness that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And brother and sister, you are absolutely, totally forgiven. The old is gone, the new has come. There isn't a sin that's so bad, so dark, so deep, that he can't just say, I don't know what you're talking about. I forgot about it already. God remembers that he forgets all of your sins every time you pray. That's what he remembers. And you and I can boldly approach his throne of grace in our time of need because of his love and his grace for you. However, because we've been forgiven much, we love much. Isn't that right? When, when your love is waning towards the Lord, remember how much he has forgiven you of. Remember what he says in Matthew chapter 18 about the unforgiving servant who was forgiven of millions and released from bondage, and yet along the way he finds a man who owes him hundreds and he throws him in prison. When the master finds out about it, he says, woe is you. And then it gets really, really dark talking about judgment to the person that's been forgiven but yet is unwilling to forgive. So here's what we know coming to the Lord's Supper. We maintain unity when we are constantly reminded of our forgiveness. Secondly, there's a reason Jesus wanted us to eat the Lord's Supper consistently together. Actually, I love the idea of doing it weekly. I really do. Can't find any reason uh, biblically that you shouldn't do it weekly. I think it's great. I think it's good when the, the body worships around these elements. I think it's fantastic. But one thing that we realize is when we eat it, when we partake of it, you once again are saying, Jesus, I take this cup and I internalize it. I take this body and I internalize it. So think about the disciples and how they were challenged to drink that cup and eat that bread and what it really meant. So if this were a timeline right here. So Jesus, they have the Passover meal on Thursday and they're gathered together in that upper room. And he does the, the elements, the, the wine and the bread, and they internalize it. At this moment, they didn't really know the full impact of what that meant. Because remember, Jesus finishes. It says that they sing a hymn after they, they partake of it, probably just as I am, or victory in Jesus. And, and they're walking, they leave. And they go down towards the Kindred Valley. And as they leave that area, they're walking along a little path. The Kindred Valley's to the right, and there's this vineyard. Right there. And John chapter 15, he talks about, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He used everything as an illustration. Then he goes down the Kindred Valley, and then he comes back up to the Mount of Olives. And on the Mount of Olives is this incredible garden, which means kind of a, uh, the garden is, a, is an orchard. And it's an olive orchard. And it's the olive garden. And right there is when he goes into prayer. He knows what's about to happen. The disciples don't. He tells them to pray. He moves aside and he gets in a time of solitude and he is praying and he knows what's about to happen. And he says this, Father, allow this cup to pass before me. And then he goes back and he prays. He goes back to the disciples, make sure he has prayer support and they're asleep. And he says, couldn't you stay awake and pray one hour, at least one hour? And they're like, sorry, Jesus, we're kind of tired. And they have no idea what's going on. I think about, about that when I take the Lord's Supper. If I really know what's going on or am, am I just slumbering in this society of all the politics and all the social media and all my needs and all my toys, am I just sleeping instead of realizing what it is to truly ingest, internalize the message? 
Because here's the message. The message is very clear. Jesus says, not my will be done, but yours, Father. And when he said, take this cup away from me, you know what he ends up doing? Drinking it. It's an idiom from the Old Testament. Drinking the cup that God gives you. See, we are accustomed to the Americanized Jesus. You know what the Americanized Jesus is. I mean, every picture of Jesus you see, he looks like some kind of swift ski instructor, you know, with the long blonde hair. And if you just add a little Jesus to your business, you're going to have a great business. And if you add a little Jesus to your marriage, you should have a good marriage, at least if your partner agrees. And then if you add a little Jesus to your soul, then you should be able to lift up your head and have your best life now. And it's a lie, and it leads a lot of people to destruction. Do you know that? The Americanization of Jesus is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll hear people say this, just bow your head, close your eyes, pray this simple prayer, and you're like, whoo, glad I got that health thing taken care of, got my fire insurance, and then we no longer have any intention whatsoever of putting Jesus first, rearranging our priorities, reevaluating, self-examining our family of origin status and the way that we did communication and the way that we do money and the way that we do sin and the way that we do life. But what Jesus Jesus calls us to do when we partake of that bread and that juice, we are internalizing God, not my will, but yours be done. Look, if Jesus wanted mega, mega churches and that's all he wanted, then he just would have stayed at the Sermon on the Mount. And he just would have said, blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. I know you're poor, but you're going to be rich. I know you're peaceful, but you're going to be mighty in the kingdom. But he didn't. Those 10,000 people on the side of the mountain, turned out to be zero when he was hanging on the cross. And from the time of that north side of Galilee to the time he went to the cross, he kept saying, I don't think you really want to follow me because I don't see you picking up your cross and willing to die. As if to say the Christian message isn't about making your life better. The Christian message is about you crucifying yourself and living for Jesus. That's the Jesus of the Bible. And it is a stark contrast to the popularity of just everybody add a little Jesus. Jesus, why don't you just be my co-pilot? Let me steer, but you just be there in case I'm going to crash. And that's just not what he portrays. And when you and I partake of the Lord's Supper, it's not about me. It's about him. And I do self-examination. In fact, that's what he says. He says, you are to examine yourself before you take the Lord's Supper. So we are constantly, I, (laughs) look, I don't know what any of your issues are. I know I've got so many things that the Lord brings up in my life when I'm, when I'm coming before the Lord that I got to deal with me, you deal with you, but you do have to deal with you. You must. I don't know what it is. I don't even want to know unless I can help you, but that's between you and God. Who you are in private is who you are. Who you are in private is who you are. If in private you're all worried about what people think on you on social media or you're worried about uh, what triggered you on the news or you're worried about all these things, and let me tell you, why don't you do some self-examination? Join me. It's hard work. It's painful. Crucifying self is not easy. But when there's conflict, man, we have got to go to work. And we have got to evaluate. Say, God, search me. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. First of all, remember that you've been forgiven, and therefore you forgive others. Secondly, remember the way of the cross. Remember what taking the Lord's Supper really does. But also, remember your allegiance. And that is this whole whole anti-imperialistic meal. In other words, we are raising the cup to Jesus. We talked about that last week. And I surrender my life to Jesus so that He is Lord and no one else is. And listen, here's here's, here's what happens. When you partake of the Lord's Supper or when you're praying or when you're in the Word, if you do this, then you get what you want, which is Jesus. You get Him. Because he's real. And he's worthy to follow. And when when you do this, you get him. I mean, what else do you want? A couple more years on your life? Okay. There it is. I hope you enjoyed it. It's now over. 
You want more toys? You want more friends? Look, I'm not saying any of those things are bad. But when you have Jesus and you have his voice and you have his love and his peace and his kindness and his goodness and his gentleness and his self-control, man, you're looking like Jesus. And you radically change. And you have peace like you've never had it. You have joy that nothing can give you like this. You get what you're looking for, and it's Him. Let's pray together. Lord, we we love you and thank you for your incredible goodness towards us. And Lord, we repent of self and sin and selfishness. And Lord, the, the, the times how we want to look really important to other people or we want to look really pretty to other people, or we want to look really smart to other people, or we want to look very successful to other people. And Lord, we just give all that up to you. Lord, we we want your cup that you give us. Lord, we want to hear your voice say, you're my child. Well done. Lord, we want to experience the spirit of adoption to where we we are completely at peace in your presence. Lord, thank you for the way in which you give that to us, that we get you. And Lord, when we have you, we are absolutely satisfied. Lord, I thank you for Glenn Meadows. I thank you for everyone who does self-examination under the authority of the spirit under the authority of the word of God. And Lord, make make us like you. Lord, I pray that our worship constantly, consistently, and effectively pleases you because of the condition of our hearts. Lord, I pray that our unity is reflective of the Trinity. Lord, that our unity is a powerful force in this world that they know that we are your disciples by the way in which we love one another, even in our conflicts. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, listen, if you don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior, he he wants you now. And here's all you do. You just confess your sins. I'm a sinner, and here's what I've done. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and he is Lord. If you confess and you believe, you are saved. You're born again. You can express it in a prayer if you would like, but by believing and repenting, you are his child. Pastor is going to be on front if you'd like to pray with them or you have any questions, we'd love to minister to you. But let's all stand together and let's worship the Lord. Sing this chorus with me. In God. You're so good, God, you're so good, God, you're so good, you're so good to me. Sing it out. And God, you're so God, you're
God bless you guys. You are dismissed. Have a great week.